those who oppose him perpetually with their lives, the very one who sustains them, in whom we have our life, and in whom we live and move and have our being. For those who re reject the very one that sustains them, verse 8 continues, but with an overflowing flood, he will make a complete destruction of its place and will pursue his enemies into darkness. God will judge those that reject him. And this language is strong against Nineveh, against this city, because these people were sinning flagrantly against the Lord. And oh, how God had been patient toward them. Again, God had sent them a prophet to minister his very word to them, his oracle in small measure to them. And they repented. And that would have been something that their ancestors would have known about. It would have been something that would have been passed along, but a generation or two after the fact, rejection began and it continued and it built up to the place that we're in today. But God didn't take them out right away. No, God had been patient. God had been kind toward them and allowing them to live, allowing them to even sin against him. And as time goes on with opportunity to repent, we see God's kindness in that. And in Romans 2, 4, Paul says, do you think lightly of the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience? Their kindness and patience being linked, not knowing that the kindness of God leads you to repentance. God had been kind and forbearing and patient toward Nineveh, but they responded by sinning all the more multiplying sin in the land opposed to righteousness where they were once tender and sensitive and convicted at the preaching of Jonah, that judgment would come, that the city would be overthrown in 40 days, they were now calloused and hardened. And in verse 14, we read this, Yahweh has commanded concerning you, there will no longer be seed from your name. From the house of your gods, I will cut off graven image and molten image, I will prepare your grave, for you are contemptible. So at this point, with where we are in our study, is we're on the precipice of entering into chapter 2, the nail is in the coffin. And it's only a matter of time at this juncture before this happens, this destruction that we're speaking of. And based on what we know, it would seem that under, or it would be just slightly under two decades after Nahum stopped ministering. Nahum was ministering from around 650 BC to 630 BC for around two decades. And then it is, uh, it is um, in the year 612 BC that Nineveh was destroyed. And so within, two, within 20 years of Nahum ministering, this judgment that we're reading about today, it would come to pass. And while last week in our study, and really for uh, a couple of weeks, we've seen Nahum declare that Nineveh's destruction is coming. It's on the horizon. It's around the corner. Today, what we're going to see in chapter 2 is Nineveh's judgment described. We're going to see it described decades before it happens. We're going to see how it's going to happen. And as God was calling the shots, declaring that destruction is going to come, he calls the shots with the description too. He shows us and unveils for us what this will look like. In this book, the book of Nahum, it stands for us as a reminder of God's power. God is just. God is good. And because of who he is, he will act powerfully against sin. And as Nahum's work was to be a comfort to those in Judah, as they could know with confidence that their enemy in the Assyrian capital of Nineveh would be undone, the book of Nahum, is to be a comfort to you and me as God's people at present as well. Because as God promised Nineveh's judgment and it came to pass, we know as well that one day, as God has been faithful in the past, he will be faithful in the future. That is, evil has been judged in the past, evil will be judged in the future. One day we know all things will be made right all things will be made new because the same powerful God 
who brought an end to the city of Nineveh under Assyrian control, will one day bring an end to evil as we know it forevermore. Its effect in the world, its effect against us, it will be no longer. God is powerful. God remains true to his word of promise. We're reminded of that through this study of Nineveh. Even in line with Jesus' word in Matthew 24, 35, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. So we'll go ahead and jump in. Chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. The one who scatters has come up against you. Guard the fortification, watch the road, strengthen your loins, instill your power with exceeding courage. For Yahweh will restore the majesty of Jacob like the majesty of Israel. Even those who empty them have emptied them to destruction and ruined their vine branches. So this section here is interesting for a number, number of reasons. We have a, a contrast at the beginning. This section, it reminds me a bit, just in chapter 2, actually of what we see in Daniel chapter 2. And so I want to read a little bit of it for you this morning, a chapter that's well known to most of you. In chapter verses 1 through 6 of Daniel 2, we read this. Now, in the second year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams, and his spirit was troubled, and his sleep left him. Then the king said to call in the magicians, the conjurers, the sorcerers, and the Chaldeans to tell the king his dreams. So they came in and stood before the king. Then the king said to them, I had a dream and my spirit is troubled to know the dream. And the Chaldeans then spoke to the king in Aramaic, O king, live forever. Say the dream to your servants and we'll declare the interpretation. The king answered and said to the Chaldeans, the word from me is firm. If you don't make known to me the dream and its interpretation, you'll be torn limb from limb and your horses or your houses, excuse me, will be made a rubbish heap. But if you declare the dream and its interpretation, you will receive from me gifts and reward and great glory. Therefore, declare to me the dream and its interpretation. So Nebuchadnezzar, he's unsettled to say the least. We see that he's troubled. Sleep leaves him. It wasn't a normal dream. So he calls in the best people that he knows of to help him understand what's going on. And notably, none of them fear God. Nebuchadnezzar, he's on to their trickery, probably on to it before he even called them in, their manipulation. And he's asking for the, not just the interpretation, but the dream, the dream itself. He needs to know, in order for him to be confident that they can tell the interpretation of the dream, they need to be able to know the dream without him telling them about it. If they can't figure out what his dream was, then he knows they're wasting his time. They can just make something up like any palm reader today or something like that. Oh, this line's going this way. That means things are going south for you or whatever. <laughs> Stay away from that um, in all seriousness. Don't, don't ever look into those sorts of things as demonic and evil. But in verses 10 through 11, we read this. Then the Chaldeans answered the, the king and said, There is not a man on earth who is able to declare the matter for the king inasmuch as no great king or powerful ruler has ever asked about a man or matter like this of any magician, conjurer, or Chaldean. Moreover, the matter which the king asks is difficult. There's no one else who could declare it to the king except gods whose dwelling place is not with flesh. So they're, they're, like, they're right and they're not right. So they're right in acknowledging there's absolutely no human that could do what Nebuchadnezzar is asking. And all of the modern day fortune tellers would do well to listen to those words there from the Chaldeans. Men don't know the hearts of men. Now where they're wrong, of course, is in, in suggesting that the panoply of gods, plural, idols, the, the figments of men's imaginations, that they, they could do it. They can't. Psalm 115, 1 through 8, not to us, Yahweh, not to us, but to your name give glory because of your loving kindness, because of your truth. Why should the nation say, where now is their God? But our God is in the heavens. He does whatever he pleases. Their idols are silver and gold, the work of man's hands. They have mouths, but they don't speak. They have eyes, but they don't see. Ears, they don't hear. Noses, but they don't smell. As for their hands, they don't feel. As for their feet, 
They don't walk. They don't make a sound with their throat. Those who make them will be like them, everyone who trusts in them. So clearly the statues of Babylon can't tell Nebuchadnezzar's dream any more than the con artist asking that he's asking for help. Only the living God knows the future. Only the living God can declare the shots and call them with absolute precision. Only he knows the hearts of men. And in Daniel 2, 25 through 28, we see this confirmed. Then Arach hurriedly brought Daniel before the king and said thus to him, I have found a man among the exiles from Judah who can make the interpretation known to the king. The king answered and said to Daniel, whose name was Belshazzar, are you able to make to me the dream, make known to me the dream which I've seen and its interpretation? Daniel answered before the king and said, As for the mystery about which the king is asking, neither wise man, conjurers, magicians, nor diviners are able to declare it to the king. However, there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries, and he has made known to King Nebuchadnezzar what will take place in the last days. This was your dream in the visions of your head while you're on your bed. I mean, that's, that's just awesome. That's, that's just so cool. Of course, those are truths, it's just there in Daniel chapter 2, that we know and understand. God is omniscient. He knows all things. God is the one who controls the affairs of men. There's a reason Nebuchadnezzar had that dream. It's not accidental. God gave it to him. God caused him to have that. There's a reason slept fled from him. There's a reason in this, that he's in this spot where he's searching people out that they might, he might learn, that he might know what's going on. And it's all because of God. But these, these truths here, this meticulous control of God, his power, his, his, his knowledge, they help form a backdrop for us as we are in, with, with Nahum chapter 2. Because we're moving from God speaking generally about judgment coming for Nineveh to precise detail. Like, this is what things are going to look like when it happens. Here's how the chariots are going to move. Here's what you're going to be wearing. Here's how your city is going to be destroyed. What's going to happen? Precise detail. Nineveh's judgment, it's laid out what, that it is going to happen and how it's going to happen. God is going to let everyone know exactly what he is going to do to this unrepentant city. And when it happens, which it has, 612 B.C., when it happens, it should absolutely bring encouragement to everybody in that time period and for us at present who trusts in the Lord and being reminded of God's authority and his faithfulness to his word. So listen to the, we're looking at the precision here. I know I read verses one and two already. I want to read them again as we, can, as we, we look toward uh, even more of the details in verses 3 and following. But again, verses two and th- or 1 and 2, the one who scatters has come up against you. Guard the fortification, watch the road, strengthen your loins, instill your power with exceeding courage. For Yahweh will restore the majesty of Jacob, like the majesty of Israel. Even those who's, who emptied them have emptied them to destruction and ruined their vine branches. And so as we come to this section, we see the scatterer. The scatterer has come upon them, upon Nineveh. Speaking of Nineveh's judgment, God is speaking about this event in the present to highlight how certain this accomplishment is. It's inevitable. Nineveh, the one who scattered Israel, who scattered other nations. Israel had been scattered in exile. She would no longer be the scatterer. Instead, she would be scattered. And the reason at this juncture is because Nineveh would no longer, and even at this time period, a time of transition, would no longer be the most powerful force and fortress in the world. See, Babylon was rising up. God was raising up Babylon. As God raised up Assyria in part for the purpose of bringing about judgment to Israel, as is clearly depicted in Isaiah chapter 10. And if you haven't been with us, you might be wondering, well, why would God do that? Well, it's because Israel is under the Mosaic covenant. They pledge themselves to be faithful. If they're not in this bilateral covenant, where both God and Israel have, 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 have pledged faithfulness to this covenant. If Israel is not faithful, then God will bring about the, the curses of Leviticus 26 and Deuteronomy 28 with a purpose of uh, disciplining them 
back or to a place of repentance that they would turn back. So anyways, God is going to be faithful. He has been. He was with Assyria who swept in and took out Israel in 722 BC. And Babylon would rise up and they would, not Assyria, but Babylon would be the ones who would take Is or Judah out into exile in 586 BC, though the um, exile was a process with three stages, but uh, coming sort of culminating there in 586 BC. But Babylon is already rising up. They're gaining strength. They're a superpower. And, it w- and once Nineveh is overthrown, Nineveh would become the capital of Babylon. And so God says, uh, effectively here, the one who scatters has come upon you. That's not Nineveh. The one who scatters is Babylon. Babylon has come upon you. And there are four commands that follow this in quick succession. And in some ways, this is a response to the foolishness of Nineveh. Nineveh had rejected God. God had shown kindness toward them. He'd sent a prophet toward them. He'd been patient toward them. But they rejected him. They were stiff-arming him and pushing him aside. And because of that, it didn't matter what they did. It didn't matter what they did. They would never be able to stop God's judgment upon them. It didn't matter in spite of all that they tried. And so what Nahum's doing here, he's effectively saying, go ahead, do all you can. See if it prevents God's judgment. Yeah, guard the walls. Yeah, you do that. Watch the roads for enemies that come. Strengthen yourself. Seek to bolster up others. Do all of these things. You can do all of these things. You can try your best and your hardest within your might to thwart the Almighty. But it will be like rearranging the chairs on the Titanic. The Titanic is sinking no matter what you do. You can't stop it. You cannot stop God's judgment. You can try, but your endeavor will be futile. In this picture of Nineveh sinking, as we see in verse 2, is contrasted with a picture of Judah rising. It might not be what we'd expect at this point in our study in this section, but there's a connection here. So when Nineveh is under the power of Assyria, the people of Judah and Nineveh were oppressed or excuse me, Judah and Israel, were both oppressed. And we've seen that in our study of kings. Both the southern and northern kingdoms were paying tribute to Assyria. Then Assyria came against both of them to attack. Again, in 722 BC, we read this uh, earlier in our study in 2 Kings 17, verses 1 through 6. In the twelfth year of Ahaz, king of Judah, Hoshea, the son of Elah, became king over Israel and Samaria and reigned nine years. And he did what was evil in the sight of Yahweh, only not as the kings of Israel who were before him. Shalmaneser, king of Assyria, went up against him, and Hoshea became his servant and paid him tribute. But the king of Assyria found conspiracy in Hoshea, who sent messengers to So, king of Egypt, and had offered no tribute to the king of Assyria, as he had done year by year. Therefore, the king of Assyria shut him up and bound him in prison. Then the king of Assyria went up against the whole land, and he went up to Samaria and besieged it three years. In the ninth year of Hoshea, the king of Assyria captured Samaria and took away Israel into exile to Assyria and settled them in Halah and Habor on the river Gozan and the cities of the Medes. And of course, the reason that Assyria triumphs here is not because they're so strong and so mighty, but it's because of God. God strengthened them to that end. God can strengthen someone like David, 5'6", five, 5'7", five, to take down 9-foot-plus Goliath. God does as he pleases. The reason that they won, that Assyria won, most pointedly, is because Israel's in sin. So just by way of reminder with the Mosaic Covenant, Leviticus 26, verses 6 through 8, I shall give you peace in the land so that you may lie down with no one making you tremble. So this is if they're faithful. Doesn't that sound great right there, peace in the land? Lying down? That sounds great to me. It sounds, I mean, that, I mean, we think about even many places in the world at present that are at war. And no sword will pass through your land? But you'll pursue your enemies. They'll fall before you by sword. And five of you will pursue 100. And 100 will pursue 10,000. I mean, we think of the account with Gideon. Like We see this happen biblically. And your enemies will fall before you by the sword. 
faithfulness looks, looks so good. Peace in the land. And that's not to mention really the pinnacle and the highlight of faithfulness is seen in Deuteronomy uh, chapter 28, verses 10 through 12, where God will walk with the people. It's like Eden. Faithfulness looks so good in the Mosaic covenant. So the fact that Israel's taken out into exile in 2 Kings 17 is because they were in unrepentant sin. And if you've gone through a study of the book of Kings, you know that that is very much the case, rejecting the Lord perpetually. Like even in the book of Judges, you have more intermittent turnarounds and revivals than we see in the book of Kings, I'd argue. But the reasoning, 2 Kings 17, 7 and following, now this happened because the sons of Israel had sinned against Yahweh their God, who'd brought them up from the land of Egypt from under the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and they had feared other gods. So, I mean, just as we're thinking through, I mean, just be thinking through the Ten Commandments, the thinking through the Mosaic Covenant as we go through this, and walked in the statutes of the nations whom Yahweh had dispossessed from before them, the sons of Israel, and in statutes of the kings of Israel, which they'd made. And the sons of Israel did things secretly, which were not right against Yahweh their God. Moreover, they built for themselves high places in all their cities, from watchtower to fortified city, and they set for themselves sacred pillars and ashram on every high hill and under every green tree, and they burned incense on all the high places as the nations did, which Yahweh had taken into exile before them. They did evil things to provoke Yahweh to anger, and they served idols concerning which Yahweh had said to them, you shall not do, such, not do this thing. Yet Yahweh warned Israel and Judah by the hand of all his prophets and every seer saying, turn from your evil ways and keep my commandments, my statutes, according to the law, all the law, which I commanded your fathers in which I sent you by the hand of my slaves, the prophets. However, they did not listen, but stiffened their neck like their fathers who did not believe in Yahweh, their God. So I think you get the point. Same was true of Judah, southern kingdom, 2 Kings 18, 13. Now, in the 14th year of King Hezekiah, Sennacherib, and this is with reference to the, with Assyria opposing the people. I certainly know that Judah had been in sin as well. Under Hezekiah, they were living more rightly, and we rejoice in that. But I want to show you how, so we saw just recently, why Israel was being oppressed by Assyria. Now I want to show you that Judah is being oppressed by Assyria. 2 Kings 18, 13, now in the 14th year, King Hezekiah Sennacherib, king of Assyria, came up against all the fortified cities of Judah and seized them. So Judah was in sin. Therefore, Sennacherib is able to take the outlying cities and then came all the way up to Jerusalem's walls. Um, in Isaiah 10, 12, we read, so it will be in that day when the Lord has completed all his work on Mount Zion and on Jerusalem, he will say, I will punish the fruit of the arrogant heart of the king of Assyria and the pomp of his eyes, which are raised high. So we can gather there that, that, that there is a purpose in Assyria oppressing Judah, even causing them through discipline to turn to the Lord. So they come up to the walls. We see that with Rabshakeh and others in chapter 18, the delegates, the emissaries, and the, the, if you remember, the people of uh, the, the Hezekiah's men come out and they basically say, hey, let, let's, um, let's have this conversation effectively in Aramaic. And they're like, no, we're going to have this uh, in the, we're going to have this in Hebrew so everyone can hear and understand because the people in the wall were eavesdropping. And so they'd come all the way up, but it was through this, through Assyria coming to oppress Jerusalem that uh, we saw, we saw a, 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 a turn from the people to the Lord, and therefore the city was protected, 185,000 Syrians destroyed. Syria, though, the point being is a capital, or a Syria whose capital is Nineveh, these people had thoroughly oppressed Judah and Israel, and yet in Nahum 2, in verse 2, we see Israel will be restored. So one day the land won't be destroyed. One day their vineyards, which had been ravaged by Assyria, they will flourish. One day they will thrive. This is what happens when enemies like unrepentant Nineveh are gone. And the restoration... Uh, um, after the one uh, in the more immediate future, of which there would be uh, during um, 
Uh, there would be seasons of, of blessing that wouldn't last all that long, but there would be seasons of blessing. And after the Babylonian captivity, there was some of that as well. But all of this really, uh, it, while there are, we see tastes of what will be fully and finally what we're looking toward, we have tastes of that sort of intermittently throughout history. But all of those foreshadow the blessing that will come even in the land that we've spoken about already in the Minor Prophets in the Kingdom Come. And we read about that in Amos 9, 13 through 15, where we read this, Behold, days are coming, declares Yahweh, when the plowman will overtake the reaper, and the treader of grapes, him who sows seed, when the mountains drip, with, will drip sweet wine, and the, all the hills will melt. Also, I will restore the captivity of my people, Israel, and they will rebuild the desolate cities and live in them. They will also plant vineyards and drink their wine and make gardens and eat their fruit. I will also plant them on their land and they will not again be uprooted from their land, which I've given them, says Yahweh, your God. And boy, that sounds good. Sounds good because that's the fulfillment of the Abrahamic covenant right there. We haven't seen the fulfillment of this yet, but seeing the people not removed from their land as is expected, living perpetually, enduringly in the land, according to Genesis 17, 7 through 8. And so this sounds so great. This is what's coming. And, the, and, and, and what's uh, amazing about this time period that we're looking at is that the people are following God. The people are following God, and we rejoice in that. We look toward that. This is to be expected, but don't miss this. Assyrians, uh, Nineveh's destruction is a reminder in them being destroyed that God is going to restore Israel. And again, there's an immediate sense in which God would be protecting the people, and that's what they would be looking toward, but I'm just making a connection to the future to show one day the people will be protected forevermore, and we all long for that. But we continue in verses 3 through 7. The shields of his mighty men are colored red. The valiant men are dressed in scarlet. The chariots are enveloped in flashing steel when he is set up to march. And the cypress spears are brandished. The chariots race madly in the streets. They rush wildly in the squares. Their appearance is like torches. They dash to and fro like lightning flashes. He remembers his mighty ones. They stumble in their march. They hurry to her wall in the mantlet set up. The gates of the rivers are opened. And the palace is melted, melted away. So it stands fixed. She is exiled. She is carried away. And her maidservants are moaning like the sound of doves beating, their, beating on their hearts. Now it's possible that in these verses we see the opposing army of Babylon described at the beginning here. But I think based on where we're going in verse 6, it's less likely that this is speaking about Babylon here. I think in verses 3 through 5, we've transitioned actually to inside the walls of Nineveh to looking at Nineveh getting ready for war. They know that they're being attacked. They know that they're being opposed by Babylon. And so here is what they try to do. They are doing what was seen already in verse 1. What did Nahum say? Guard the fortification. Watch the road. Strengthen your loins. It's still your power with exceeding courage. That's what's happening in verses 3 through 5. Nineveh's doing it. Nineveh's trying to get ready for this battle that's going to take place. She's trying to do everything that she can to protect herself. They've got their shields. We see that. Their shields are red, either from blood or it's uh, dyed animal skin. It's a type, uh, it would be dyed leather. Another option would be that they're metal, maybe copper and glinting in the sunlight, they look red. There are options here, since they're getting ready for battle, maybe blood is less likely, though it could be dried on there for intimidation. I don't know exactly uh, what it, they are red from, but those are the options that are possible here, but they are red, we see that. That means if they show up with blue shields, this prophecy doesn't come to pass particular detail. Their shields are red. And if they aren't dressed in scarlet, if they aren't dressed in red to match, it's not a word from the Lord, but they were. And there are chariots and they're armed and the sunlight catches them. Their spears are sharpened and ready for attack. I mean, chariots 
It's not hard to pick an exact modern equivalent, but if you think of tanks today, I mean, this is some of the strongest ground attack that you would have. This is a force to be reckoned with, and we see that. But in spite of all their preparation, Nineveh, the great city, as Jonah says in, in the book of Jonah, it's exceedingly great. The city that no one thought could be defeated. How could they ever be undone? How could it ever fall? Like Jericho, if you want to think of an equivalent, a biblical equivalent. This city is about to meet its match. And it's amazing how history so consistently repeats itself. Because the same God is living and active. When a nation raises up its heart against the Lord, the Lord ensures it's destroyed. Happens time after time after time after time. Judah and Israel weren't exempt from that. If there's anyone you thought might be exempt from that, be those who receive the word of the prophets, the oracles of God, the covenants, the promises, they were judged. In spite of all the preparations none of it made back in verse 1 that we see described in, verses th- in verse 3, it'd be to no avail. And we see it in verse 4. The chariots aren't moving in a linear pattern. They're racing madly through the streets. There's confusion. It's like what we saw back in Nahum 1.10, like tangled thorns and like those who are drunken with their drink, they're consumed as stubble fully dried up. They're like drunkards. They can't successfully thwart the Lord's plans. They're not moving with unity. They're not of the same mind. The large army coming against them, they're not used to this. They're used to being the large army coming against others. It's a reversal of roles. Verse 5 seems to be describing Nineveh's last stand. The king will order his best troops to protect the wall. And they'll have difficulty getting to where they need to be amidst all the commotion and confusion. They get to the wall. The mantlet is set up. A mantlet was a tower. Some of them could be quite tall. Um, and um, there were many of them throughout Nineveh. But again, while it may protect them from spears and arrows, it will not protect them. All the protection, all of their defense, none of it can protect them from what is going to happen next in verse 6. Nineveh was destroyed by a flood. That's how Nineveh was taken out. It's likely that one of the kings, be it Sennacherib or another, who's already died at this point, to be clear, had dammed up Uh, the rivers nearby, the Tigris, and then extensions that would connect with it. In excavations, this dam or pieces of these dams, they've been recovered. The river was dammed up. And then during the attack of the Babylonians, this dam was destroyed and these rivers, the water flowed through the city, absolutely destroyed it. The city which was advanced and had developed a stockpile of water in the midst of its hot climate, this oasis, was undone by its own advancement. The gates were open. Sennacherib's, the palace there is built under King Sennacherib. Magnificent palace melted away. Melted away. Knocked down, taken out. No, no problem there. You know, I mean, when we read verse 6, I'll read read it again. The gates of the rivers are open and the palace is melted away. I mean, in many ways, whenever we see water collapsing and destroying, I mean, it brings us back to other events where that's happened. We talked a little about the flood of Noah last week. I'll reference a different account just briefly this morning. But we think about the account with Israel and its exile in Egypt. When Israel's removed from Egypt, how is the the Egyptian army destroyed? Through water. Water collapsing upon itself, through, through the, and the people were destroyed. Nineveh is destroyed and undone by water. The one who sent many into exile, for those who survived from this, they would now get a taste of their own medicine in being exiled. The people would be gone from the city, their possessions would be gone. 
And you can see the mourning that would take place at the end of verse 7. The maidens are emphasized. Why is that? Men are gone. Gone in the flood or they've already been taken as slaves to work in particular areas. They've been taken away from their families. And the women are broken. And you can see that there at the end of verse 7. Moaning like the sound of doves. Have a lot of those out here know what that sounds like. Almost certainly and beating on their hearts. It's not repentance that we see there beating. You know, this isn't like the tax collector beating his breast, have mercy upon me, a sinner. This is different. This is just, this is just mourning over the circumstance and what had happened. They were undone. The crown of the world in their eyes and their city, their power, their hope had been destroyed all their idols as well. Brings us to verses 8 through 12. Here's commentary on what just took place. God told us right there, right there in what we've read, how Nineveh would be destroyed before it ever happened. He tells us very clearly the strategy Babylon will use. What are they going to do? Break the dams. Rivers are going to destroy the city. That's how the most powerful city in the world will be destroyed again we're looking at decades before this happened, 612 BC. It's likely that this prophecy that Nahum is giving is before the end of his ministry at 630 BC. So that's why I say multiple decades may have given this around 640 BC, somewhere around there. So verses eight and following, here's Nahum's commentary. Though Nineveh was like a pool of water throughout her days, now they are fleeing. Stand, stand. But no one turns back. Plunder the silver, plunder the gold, and there's no limit to the treasure. Wealth from every kind of desirable object. She is emptied. Yes, she is emptied out and eviscerated. Hearts are melting, not just the palace. Hearts are melting and knees knocking. Also, anguish is in all their loins and their faces turn pale. Where's the den of the lions and the feeding place of the young lions? Where the lion, lioness, and lion comes proud with nothing to make them tremble? The lion tore enough for its cubs and strangled enough for its lioness, lionesses and filled its lairs with torn up prey and its dens with torn up flesh. Nineveh was like a pool of water. Pool of water in a desert, an oasis, that is something. It's what Nineveh was like. She was a respite for many. It's a place that was well known and regarded. She was a sight to be seen. Now she's fleeing. Pool of water had a side taken out, so to speak, and now all the people are being emptied out of the city in a quick fashion for those who hadn't died, for those who remained. And as they're leaving, we see that there's a call to stand, stand, stand. Likely those in charge of their army ordering them to take a stand to stop running away. But we see here no one turns back. The people knew what happened. They'd lost. The war was over before it really effectively began. And they're just trying to do everything they can to escape. They knew that they could not win. Their city was defeated. Their homes were gone. Many of their people, their relatives were gone. They would be defeated in swift order if they tried to stand. And so they try to flee as quickly as they can. And then in verse 9, we see a call to plunder the silver and gold, the treasure. How many of you have heard of the tale of El Dorado before? Anyone? A few of you here. El Dorado, the city of gold. City of gold, story told hundreds of years ago about the city of gold in South America. City made of gold. Many people, many explorers were allured by this, this siren song to go and find this city of gold in hopes of acquiring limitless gold and treasure. And many people lost their lives. In some ways, Nineveh was like that in the ancient world. She was a city of gold. I mean, think about this superpower who had plundered so many nations. 
taking all of their treasures, all of their resources. She had a stockpile of wealth. And now, and now she's defeated. And Nahum is calling Babylon here. Plunder the silver. Plunder the gold. In judgment, take it all from Nineveh. Take it all away. There's no limit to the treasure. No limit to it, we see. In verse 9, Nineveh's identity was centered on its idols and its gold. Now, I haven't looked into it. I imagine with the consistent translation of the LSB, and I could look it up, we really are almost out of time, though, and we've gone over a lot lately, so we'll try not to do that today. But um, I imagine it's the same word when it says desirable there. Where's another place in Scripture where that word desirable is used that comes to mind? Like desirable to make one wise. Genesis 3 the temptation account with Eve and the serpent. I wonder if it's the same word there. Um, and I ha I'm just thinking of this, you know, here, but I'm just trying to, you know, wealth from every kind of desirable object. I just, yeah, I'd like to look into that connection a little bit more. I don't have much more to say there, but it is interesting if it is the same word that's used there. Um, there's, an, there's, you know, they're allured by their gold. You know, uh, where your treasure is, there your heart is, uh, there your heart will be. And uh, their treasure uh, was uh, their life. Um, their idols would have been covered with gold and things like that. And their idols, of course, clearly couldn't protect the city, weren't powerful or real. The gold couldn't do anything for them either. There's no buying off this competing power. They're coming in to take everything such that the city is considered emptied. The city's empty of people. All the wealth that belonged to Nineveh, and Assy Nineveh belongs to Babylon. The people's hearts melted. Knees knocking. Again, Nineveh thought she could never fall, never be overtaken, and she was mistaken. She was humbled. She didn't humble herself. No, she's humbled. She's humbled by the Lord. Where she humbled herself under the preaching of Jonah, she's humbled by the Lord here. Nineveh, the den of lions, was no more. The den's gone. Where she's gonna run, where's she going to run to now? That's the idea. She'd been the top dog, been the top lion. We think of the lion as the apex of the, the food chain, or at least we describe that, the lion in that way to children, certainly in some regard. Or, uh, as, certainly, you probably do that with kids. We'll typically do that, but... That was their view, that the lion, no one can match the lion. And then the lion's gone. Nineveh had become lazy. She's resting on her laurels, and the charade's done. And we see in verse 13, Behold, I am against you, declares Yahweh of hosts, and I will burn up her chariots in smoke, and a sword will devour your young lions, and I will cut off your prey from the land, and no longer will the voice of your messengers be heard. So the Lord declares with no ambiguity at all, absolutely zero, what we've already seen displayed, Yahweh is against Nineveh. Why does all of this happen? How could Babylon defeat Nineveh? How could the, the, the scatterer, the original scatterer, if we want to think of it that way, Nineveh be destroyed? How could a flood happen? Well, it's God. Yahweh is against you. Yahweh is the reason for this judgment. Yahweh stands against those who reject him. And the chariots in verses 3 and 4 that we read about that were racing madly, wildly. In verse 13, they're burned up. The young lions of Nineveh, those who were going to take over at the top of Nineveh's food chain, so to speak, the princes, the nobles, they'll be killed. There'd no longer be an opportunity for them to prey on others around them. Babylon would take care of that. Her authority, her power that she'd been given in Nineveh would be gone. Be gone like Nebuchadnezzar's would be stripped away later on, the Babylonian king in Daniel chapter 4. And any voice she had, any voice she had with surrounding regions, connections, gone gone. God is powerful. 
and this is, again, decades before Nineveh's destruction. We see that it is going to happen, how it's going to happen. We see the effects of it. And as we began this morning, as I said to you, there's, there's a phrase, there are certain phrases that you never want to hear. And we see one of them here in our text this morning. Yahweh says, behold, I am against you. And friends, while that was said of Nineveh, you know, back in the year 640 BC, don't let it be said of your life that Yahweh stands against you. Yahweh stands against all who stand against him. Make no mistake about it. And if you are here this morning and you are, have not turned to the Lord by faith, if you have not trusted in Jesus Christ alone for your salvation, do not be surprised if you continue in your state of sin, in your state like Nineveh of rejecting God's provision, that one day you wake up in the judgment of the Lord. God is true to his word. He is faithful. If you reject him in this life, he will reject you in the next. But God has been so merciful. He has been so merciful to sinners like you and me because God the Almighty, the very one who is holy and has been offended, offended by sinners like you and me, that very God is the one who has made a way for us to be made right with him. It's not something that we could ever do. We've already sinned against him. We've already violated and, and, and marred ourselves, covered ourselves in the stains of our sin. There's nothing that we could do to make ourselves right with God as though we could clean ourselves up and make ourselves pure. The Lord says this standard is perfection. Once you've sinned once, you can't be perfect. And that's bad news for us as sinners because all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, as Paul says in Romans 3.23. But the good news of the gospel is this, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Christ died. He laid down his life as a sacrifice in the place of all who come to him by faith. Jesus, the one the Father, rather, sent his son, Jesus, who knew no sin, never sinned in his life, to be sin on our behalf that we might become the very righteousness of God in him. Jesus Christ came into this world and he lived a life without sin, the very standard that we were called to live up to. And he died on a cross, the death that we deserve to die. What do I mean by that? On the cross at Calvary, Jesus bore the very wrath and judgment that we deserve to suffer under for an eternity in hell. He paid the penalty for all of our sins, though he had committed none. He died for his enemies in order to make them his friends. And on the third day, he rose from the grave, and he is alive today. And friend, if you have not trusted in Jesus for salvation... Know that, you, that God does stand against you at present. Know that things do not get better from here when people will flippantly say, rest in peace, that is only true of the godly. If you read the end, I think it's Isaiah 48, 57, and 66. At the very end, um, there, it's communicated, there is no peace for the wicked. A friend, you can come to the Lord Jesus Christ this morning by faith if you trust in what he has done. Jesus has died. He is raised. All who believe upon him as a substitute, as our representative, the one who has come to save us from our sins, will have salvation. That can be yours this morning. Eternal life, all of your sins forgiven, robed in Christ's own righteousness. The filthy rags, your garments, your guilt, your sin, paid for in full by Christ, his righteous life imputed, given to you. But you must come to him by faith. And if you come to him, as Jesus says in John 6, he will by no means cast you out. You don't need to fear being rejected by Jesus who died to save sinners. Lord willing, next week, well, actually next week we won't have Sunday school, 
because we just have our Easter service, our Resurrection Sunday service next Sunday. Lord willing, we'll have service outside. And so, um, Lord willing, at the beginning of April, I believe it's April, s no, it's actually, well, April 7th we'll have service, but I think it'll be April 14th, actually, that we'll pick back up with Nahum chapter 3. And so there'll be a little bit of a break here, but I do encourage you to read Nahum chapter 3 before we get there. Let's go ahead and go to the Lord in a word of prayer at this time. Father, we are thankful for who you are. Lord, you are merciful and gracious, and it is overwhelming. It is overwhelming to think that you have made a way for sinners to be made right with you, the very thing that we don't deserve and then for us to think of the cost that was necessary to secure that, it simply overwhelms us. The death of your only begotten son on the cross who willingly came that we might be made right with you. Father, we, we will praise you forevermore for that reality. We praise you this morning for that reality. And Lord, I pray if there are any here this morning who have not simply come to receive the gift of the gospel the gift of salvation. Lord, I pray that all of your lost sheep would be found. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Friend, I encourage you to say hello to those that are around you. If you need to grab water or coffee, now is a great time to do that, and we'll reconvene in about 15 minutes.